Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. I am so, so excited to be hosting all of you. Uh, I hope you are having a wonderful early morning if you are in Alaska, midday if you are somewhere in between Alaska and Europe, and a good evening if you are joining us from Europe, Russia, uh, or maybe very ambitiously in Asia uh, in the wee hours of the morning. My name is Victoria Herman. I am Managing Director of the Arctic Institute, and I have the incredible privilege of hosting the Breaking the Ice Ceiling webinar series, which is what we are going to uh, get into in just a moment. The Breaking the Ice webinar series is a series that's happening throughout 2021, where we are featuring over 25 amazing women working in the Arctic and Antarctic. We have heard already from 10 brilliant traditional and indigenous knowledge holders, educators, artists, scholars, and scientists. And we have many more in the months to come. Today, we have two incredible speakers for you, but before I introduce them and do a bit of housekeeping, I would love to know where everyone is zooming in from today. So if you could, while we are letting people in from the waiting room, please put where you are located in the chat box so we can see just how many places we have in our webinar to hear. Dr. Middleton and Dr. Lovecraft's presentations today. Uh, I always love seeing just how many places around the world we can get on one Zoom. And I see we are already getting some fantastic places. We have a good morning from Anchorage. We also have uh, Canada, the Netherlands, New Hampshire. Uh, we have another uh, another Canada, a hello from Sweden. Uh, we have a Black Forest in Germany. We have the United Kingdom in the house, Oregon, Oslo in Norway. We have many, many places across Canada. I think we actually have the entire spread from Halifax uh, and I think to Vancouver um, and Waterloo in between. Uh, we have many states here. So if you are just joining us, hello again, welcome. My name is Victoria Herman. I'm the Managing Director of the Arctic Institute and I'll be moderating our webinar today. We are going to get started in one minute and we're asking everyone to put where they are geographically located in the chat box so we can see all of the amazing places across the globe that we have on this one Zoom. Uh, so I see we also have many places from across Europe. We appreciate you coming later in your evening. Uh, we have someone closer to me in Washington, D.C., in Virginia. Um, a really great spread and one I'm sure will grow as we hear from a few more folks uh, connecting from the waiting room. So in just a moment, I am going to introduce our first speaker. Before we do a bit of housekeeping, we will have two presentations today from Dr. Middleton and Dr. Lovecraft. We'll first be hearing from Dr. Middleton and then right after I will introduce Dr. Lovecraft. At the end of both presentations, we will have a question and answer session. If you have questions throughout the presentations, please type them in the chat box. I will be monitoring that throughout the presentations and I will be direct messaging each of you who has a question to see if you would like to come on and ask during the Q&A 
or if you're in a place with low broadband or in a noisy location, I can read it out for you. So please don't wait till the Q&A. If you have pressing questions during the presentations, put those in the chat and I will be making a list of all of those. As a reminder, this is being recorded. So if you have to leave a bit early, you can always catch the remaining part of the webinar on the recording. I will be emailing that out after our webinar later today. So please check on your inboxes for that video and also some additional upcoming webinars that we have in the next few weeks. Okay, I think that is more than enough from me. Uh, I'm now going to introduce our first speaker, the real spotlights of the show. And our first speaker is coming to us from Finland. Uh, Dr. Alexandra Middleton is a researcher with a PhD in economics and business administration from the University of Ulu. Her research focuses on sustainable business development in the Arctic and the socioeconomic changes happening there. Now, she has published much, much research on sustainable development, business, demographics, human capital, innovations, employment, and connectivity solutions in the Arctic, a few of which we'll be sharing in the follow-up email so you can learn more about her research. Today, her presentation is going to talk about Arctic science communicated by women, the heart and sense dilemma. She's going to explore how Arctic women researchers are avid communicators of their research through different typically non-academic outlets like media, social media, podcasts, and what that means for engagement with stakeholders. I am about to share Dr. Middleton's uh, recorded lecture. She is also here live and will be uh, taking questions in the Q&A. Um, she just is in a bit of a louder household. So we have her video and I'm going to play that now. All right, Dr. Middleton, I am handing off my virtual mic to you. Hello, everyone. Let me just share my screen so we can start the presentation. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm so happy to be invited to talk at this uh, series, Bre Breaking the Ice Ceiling, about the topic which is very close to my heart women communicate in Arctic science and gender perspectives in research in general. So today I will talk about my personal insights about uh, women in science, how it, it feels to be, and uh, what actually is the case in terms of numbers. Then I will talk about the role of feelings, why it's important to talk about feelings about career evaluation, and about possible support mechanisms. So if we look at the Arctic region, uh, the red dot on this um, map represents Murmansk. And that's actually the city where I was born. That's my hometown. And uh, back uh, in Soviet Union time, it was half a million people. Now it's about 350,000 people, but still very large and industrial city beyond the polar circle. And uh, this place is still very close to my heart as well. You know, this is me when I was six years old and I used to ask my parents, why all buildings are so gray and dull in our city? And no one actually knew why. And also when going to the daycare, it was pitch black in the morning and pitch black in the afternoon when my parents would get me from daycare. 
But that's the realities of uh, life so, so far north. But despite all this, I still love that place and visit as much as possible. So in my 20s, I moved to Finland, where I did my PhD studies. And uh, in this uh, photograph, you could see me so happy celebrating getting my PhD, also called doctoral promotion. In Finland, there is a tradition to get a hat and walk in the city center with other fellow uh, PhD graduates. Uh, it's a beautiful tradition and when you just finish your PhD, it feels like the whole world is in front of you, full of opportunities and um, career options. But um, it's not always the case. And uh, there are certain pitfalls, especially if you happen to be a woman in academia. Further, uh, I continued um, doing research in the Business Index North project. This project has been running for nearly six years. And the main goal of this project is to create uh, knowledge and a decision making tool for policymakers, for different Arctic stakeholders, like to be used to, uh, for informed decision making. We collected a lot of uh, statistical and quantitative and qualitative data and then produced several reports on demographics, uh, economics, um, employment opportunities in the Arctic and business opportunities in the Arctic. The latest report was about sustainability in the Arctic regions, where we evaluated how well Arctic regions are doing in terms of achieving UN sustainable development goals. Uh, what I can say about this project, it was very meaningful for me. It was very interesting and relevant and engaging. And um, the main product of uh, this uh, project was the report, which is not uh, per se a scientific contribution, like scientific publication that will count um, in uh, academic evaluation in towards your career progression. What I noticed um, that during this um, project, we had a lot of meetings, a lot of conferences. We went to present our findings to Arctic Economic Council, Arctic Council, um, Arctic Circle, and um, while engaging with different set of stakeholders, communicating, I understood, I understood that uh, we are actually involved in science diplomacy. Uh, then I noticed that there was an opening in the EU funded project called Using Science for in Diplomacy for Addressing Global Challenges. In this project, they had an open fellowship called Open Doors where five people from all over the world were selected. And I was one of the happy ones to be selected. So during that fellowship, we received a lot of training in science diplomacy, visited um, embassies, uh, funding agencies, went to networking and conferences. And it was very rewarding experience to me. But what I later noticed as well in my <clears throat> career as a researcher that this often doesn't count towards your research or evaluation. But still, uh, most of people that uh, are engaged in science diplomacy find it very rewarding. Let's now look at uh, what happens uh, to women career once they enter science. And it's not only in neuroscience, but across uh, diversified uh, fields of science. 
we would usually have much more PhD students as females, like in this case, 55%. And uh, when we progress in the career ladder, there's few and fewer women academics left and full professors, it's only one quarter that are women. And uh, this type of um, evidence is across uh, countries. In the, in the EU, women academics held 41 academic positions across 28 countries, but out of them only 23 grade A positions. And women were a minority among senior academics in many European countries. And they held much fewer positions in academic leadership. Moreover, women academics in the UK are paid less than men. There's a mountain evidence on these disparities across uh, all academic fields. And this phenomenon is quite often called leaky pipeline. So when we think about um, women career in academia, we should also address feelings. Women quite often feel as imposters, also called imposter syndrome. It's the feeling of self-doubt, of um, incompetence or lack of belonging. And quite often it is um, supported both by external structures, organizational rules, norms, and uh, evaluation criteria for academics, because there is a lack of achievement for women and the lack of meaning in the work they do. Because often the work that I was telling you that I was so happy to do and felt so engaging to me, to me and to the stakeholders, it never counted as, um, as it never gave me any points in my career evaluation review. Then there's also the feeling of, um, anxiety when uh, women operate on very short-term contracts and uh, there is a disbalance uh, between what they want to do in their personal life uh, in their reproductive age and uh, how they are going to progress in their career so there's a lot of anxiety when you finish your phd do you wait for positions to be offered? Uh, do you apply for funding for permanent jobs? Or do you have family? Because maybe later in your life, you won't be in your best reproductive age to have family. And also there is a fear for those women academics that had career breaks due to family. How do they come back? to the field, are they recognized? How are they going to join the team? How are they going to talk about their tiredness, about uh, different identities, about managing their roles as academics? And this is all quite familiar to me because I had two career breaks due to my beautiful children, and now I have a third one actually now at the moment with a three month old uh, daughter staying home. <clears throat> it's quite interesting study that was published just in February and says, wait for a permanent contract, the temporal politics of infertility as an early career researcher where Sarah discusses all kinds of advice that is given to young female academics that you'd rather, you, you should wait for a permanent contract before you start family, before you start having children, and how this could be 
counterproductive and whether we should be at all given this such this kind of advice to women <clears throat> then there is a research published in lancet which is, talks about funders that should evaluate projects not people so in this uh, graph you could see john and jane so if they are applying with their names as john as in jane john is 1.4 times more likely to get funding than his colleague jane just based on the number of publications uh, maybe not having career breaks uh, being a lead author in many articles but when the project is only judged uh, on their basis of idea of the project then there is not such a big disparity and maybe some of you were in this position that if you have a brilliant idea if you'd like to go to some prestigious funding you would have to ask your colleague would it be male or female to be as a principal investigator just to have better chances to get funded and um, this is uh, also a known phenomenon in the arctic um, community as well the ISK uh, introduced a medal for a um, distinguished uh, contribution to the arctic science and this has been running for 12 years already and then they they, they themselves recognize disparity in gender and country nominations where most nominations are male and mostly coming from the US background. And if we think about this medal, it has been awarded um, nine times to male and three times to female um, <clears throat> contributors to the Arctic science. There's also a High North uh, Hero that was introduced by High North Dialogue Conference and it has been running for five years and uh, out of um, those heroes only one is uh, female. So in the Arctic research there is also this problem of uh, gender bias in science. And think about uh, the effect of COVID-19 that it has had on women ac academic uh, career and I quite often go to Twitter because it's so perfect for sharing academic thoughts and uh, where people are quite open about their struggles for instance Rachel wrote that um, it's not um, something that we do in academia to admit weakness but uh, going through 2020 have been really hard and uh, this tweet received so much uh, empathy because uh, nearly 200 retweets and so many people liked it and felt the same way how you can take care of your kids and at the same time meaningfully, meaningfully contribute to research and then if you are already one one step behind your male academics then it really puts you in disadvantaged position uh, when we look at this uh, evaluation rubrics uh, in finland it's uh, called publication forum and it has uh, three main levels, uh, basic, uh, leading and top. Now of 25 polar and Arctic journals, only two have two level ratings. So basically you would have to publish like 10 articles to be promoted in your career if you publish in these Arctic journals. 
And um, I always emphasize the importance of having role models. Um, for me, it's uh, Mariana Motzkot, and she proudly says that she has four kids, keeping her smiling, but she is a leading you know, academic thought provoker, very openly talking about her scientific contribution to by a stakeholder audience having several TED talks and engaging on TV and radio to make her research known. So this is a role model for me. And uh, that actually encouraged me to go and speak at a TED, TEDx all event um, about prejudices about Arctic, where I talked about Arctic people. So I encourage you to be open to new ideas, to know ingrained in great um, biases and try to overcome them. Try to find community, role models, and be open about feelings because uh, you need to be able to talk about them, how we feel as women in academia. And um, there are also great projects uh, done by the EU that I encourage you to check that they created some guidelines on how to break the institutional biases inside universities, how to include gender plans, both to universities and to project proposals, evaluations. They will be very much relevant for the Arctic research as well. So thank you very much. I hope this was um, informational for you and i will be joining you to answer any questions what a amazing talk uh if everyone could please join me in giving a huge virtual round of applause to dr middleton for being so open and really expertly bridging her personal and professional experiences i think um that likely resonated with far more than just me on this call uh, and as a reminder dr middleton is here and will be joining us live for the question and answer session. So if you have questions or comments for Dr. Middleton, please keep those ready or put them in the chat now so that I know to reach out to you when we get to that Q&A. For now, though, I am going to introduce our second brilliant speaker, Dr. Amy Lauren Lovecraft, who is a full professor at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and the director of the Center for Arctic Policy Studies at the International Arctic Research Center. She, uh, like Dr. Middleton, has dealt with being a woman in male-dominated professions like political science and geophysical science in the Arctic for quite a bit and has learned a lot about navigating those tensions in her own career but also thinking about how to help others in their early career to navigate what she has gone through. She'll be presenting today doing transdisciplinary Arctic research, Does Gender Matter? So with that, I am going to hand over my virtual mic to you, Dr. Lovecraft, and get ready for a wonderful presentation. And of course, you know, I'm like about to jump in and I'm muted. Um, so good morning and, and thank you very much, Victoria. We've never met in person, but um, I admire your work and you've actually had a, an Arctic intern, you know, from UAF. Uh, if you remember Jake Garrish, who's doing very well. Um, and good morning to everybody else who's watching. Uh, I know that this is on not on the just you see it mode, so I'll, I'll take care of that in, in just a moment. Um, so uh, I wanted to start off by uh, doing a, I know it's like we rely on PowerPoint. I think it's a, an affectation because we're not sure how to present ourselves. And I am um, 
a bit awkward talking about myself in, in this fora, but I know it's very valuable. And uh, I get a lot from listening to other people talk about their careers, even if they're not the same. Um, and so I just wanna say, uh, I'll get started. And before I do, I'm coming to you from the unceded territories of the um, Diné people here in Fairbanks, Alaska. And I want to acknowledge that and it's their stewardship that has allowed this particular region to, uh, I'm looking out my window as I turn to the left, uh, remain so beautiful. So uh, thank you. So uh, the first slide is just to let you know my email if you want to contact me. And this um, sentiment about uh, whether or not there is a glass ceiling. Um, as a young woman, I uh, didn't really understand uh, gender prejudice in the sense that I took, you know, feminist theory and I, I learned a lot um, about you know, how we uh, rested on the, or not we rest, but how we have gained from our foremothers and forefathers. And, you know, I just didn't feel any kind of gender disadvantage or prejudice, you know, in my teens and early twenties. But the older I've gotten, the more feminist I've become. In other words, I think that um, a lot is revealed over time and, and through one's real start on a career about how there are still these subtle uh, differences and even the modern recognitions, not just for we women, but for uh, race and ethnicity and other aspects of people's intersectional lives uh, are, are more important and easier to talk about. So yeah, there is there are really ceilings. They, they really do exist and um, we have to navigate them. So. I thank Alexandra for her uh, great talk. Mine will be slightly less personal and let's uh, get it going. So the four things I wanna very briefly mention to you as um, helpful, I think in, in terms of a guide for your life satisfaction and career in doing transdisciplinary work um, are just these four points. So the first one I've already mentioned, why listen to other people's stories? Because even if you don't like those people, um, their stories will still give you information about what to avoid. So there's the people you wanna imitate, there's the people you, know, you don't wanna be like, and it's really important, frankly, to um, be among all of them. So one of the uh, attributes of that I thought was interesting just to bring, I'm gonna go back and forth between my work and my personal life. And so when we listen to other people's stories, one of the things we want to uh, take care of though is that we don't view those stories as predictive. So this is just a quick slide from another woman that many, many of you know, um, and she wrote this and it kind of disappeared, but to me, it was a wonderful example of how um, there are a lot of narratives and stories out there uh, for Arctic research and for women, uh, as well as for other uh, groups in society. But basically these um, pieces of these stories tend to come together repeatedly in the exact same way. And so what we want to do, right, as we write our own stories and we create our own futures is to be able to um, not fall into these traps uh, and, and think that narration is prediction, right? They're stories and they're, they're stories that are valuable to us. Um, the, oop, there we go. The second thing I want to talk about briefly is positionality and personality. So um, this I think matters a great deal. And I've noticed it the older I get. Um, hey, and I see uh, Lauren Brannick is on the, um, the web uh, webinar. Hi, Lauren, I haven't seen you in forever. She was a master's student at UAF. Um, okay, so positionality and personality. Um, you'll see in the lower right-hand corner, I have uh, this book. This book was a, a, a fundamental revelation to me. Um, my background in terms of actual academy uh, is a bit scattered. As an undergrad, I um, went to three different institutions. And when it was time for me to graduate, I just wanted to get out in four years. So I gathered together all the credits I had and they said I was an international studies major. And so I was. Um, from there, I didn't know if I wanted to go into the academy. Um, I wasn't sure uh, what I, I thought. I just needed to make money. Uh, right. I, I had to support myself and I didn't want to do something that I had, um, you know, no interest in doing. But this would have been so I graduated from high school in 1990 and um, from college in 1994, uh, just to give you a brief timeline. And I went to I had a Fulbright scholarship and then I started graduate school in 1995 
and I finished at 29 um, in 2001. And that's when I moved to Alaska for my job. And now I'm unfit to live anywhere else. And I love uh, Alaska and, and the work I do. And so this means I'm squarely in the middle of Generation X. And now is not that time anymore. And I think one of the most important things that we women often learn is a, a nature of flexibility, a nature of relationality that often men sadly um, don't learn. Again, this is just a, a socialized issue. And of course it's changing. So one of the things we need to do uh, is think about that kind of flexibility. I have to recognize that the students I teach and the people I advise are not uh, from my generation and they do think differently. And there's great things and limiting things about this. Um, I spent a lot of time in the South. I, I grew up primarily in the South and there are wonderful things that are changing. Um, on the other hand, right, uh, it means that how we talk about and, and show our respect for and work with other people is also changing. So these are the first couple of points on this slide, right? It is easier now as women to act in new ways and to uh, break molds and to be more ourselves as opposed to what society generally has asked for us to be. Um, but this also creates then uh, new spaces for other people. I am not an indigenous person. Um, and now is the time in particular now in the last couple of years of real reckoning in terms of racial, ethnic, and maybe someday <laughs> class power situations and struggles. And this is important and it's also really taxing. Um, in other words, thinking about it, knowing about it, um, wanting to make a difference, doing things about it, is, is tiring, it honestly is. And it is tiring for everybody. This is not some sort of white woman complaint. I just mean it's a burden that we all share, especially in the United States in terms of changing how we operate. And it's tiring for everyone and it's important. The third component, right, is obviously technology. I don't like screens. Um, I struggle to keep a mobile phone around. Uh, but I have to recognize that this is a new generation and people communicate differently. And some of it is fantastic. The capacity to build communication and coalitions and get information is unbelievable. The fact that we hold in the palm of our hands, right? All of the, some information of the world, you know, that's recorded and, and online, clearly not people's uh, minds, right? There's more information out there is, is stunning but it has real problems. Um, I've watched both students and colleagues burn a lot of time on technology where they could in fact actually themselves be producing more interesting work or, or be more out in the community, but everyone's different. So we have to be wary of the group think and the inattention and the short cycles and the rhetoric that come with that communication. Then um, patience. Patience, patience, patience. So the reason I, I write this here about positionality and personality just comes to a brilliant example um, in Dylan's work, Prairie Rising. As I mentioned, uh, her positionality statement at the beginning of this um, inspired my spouse's uh, PhD positionality statement, which is also very good. But it really models in this book to me one way in which we can take phenomenally difficult concepts. In this case, it was um, the indigenous community in Saskatchewan, and in particular, the life of, uh, or rather it focused mostly on the life of one young woman who through all the different modern Western style structures had become a delinquent, right? She was in trouble with the law. She had become uh, someone who couldn't do school because her historical trauma was affecting that. She became somebody who uh, they wanted to create a medical definition for, right? She was crazy. So this book takes the time to unpack incredibly significant power structures. It's done by a woman who is fully able to acknowledge her own position in this situation. And um, I, don't, I don't make money from this book. I don't wanna go on about it. It's just a, a very recent one that I enjoyed and thought modeled well a lot of the work we would like to do. So moving quickly uh, to, to wrap up, I uh, my disciplinary training is in what's called American political development. Um, this is an approach towards politics that looks at essentially the history of contestation or why is it that we have today what we do as opposed to having different possible futures. Um, for Americans, and I'm sure others of you have this familiarity in your locations, um, it's often that the history of the nation or the region or the people, right, looked 
uh, like this. It wasn't great. And Zoom, there's this linear line that makes us all more free and equal and equitable and knowledgeable. And we all know this isn't true. We have to fight for the gains uh, that we get and we have to fight to keep them. So these points of contestation, I'm just going to briefly now uh, personalize a bit more as you might go on an academic journey or an Arctic studies journey. And uh, here I have just a few pieces of advice from my life. The first one is know yourself. I put this um, unfortunate or fortunate, depending on your positionality, quote by Jean-Paul Sartre here. Um, I, I'm an introvert. I struggle with other people. Um, I live in Alaska in part for a reason. Um, and so you got to know yourself a little bit. Clearly in our late teens and our early 20s, as many of us are starting on our uh, career path. Now, right, this might not mean that you have a career, but you're starting to really think about things. Look at yourself and don't be simple. Throughout your life, only you will be your best friend, right? Um, so help yourself out. Talk to yourself. What do you like to do? It really is true. I promise that if you do what you like, you will create a career out of it. Um, it's hard to believe this when we're young, or at least it was for me. I wanted to be self-sufficient and to have money and respect. I didn't know how I was going to do this, but you have to be able to not sell yourself short or deny that life is difficult, but you've got to think about what you really enjoy doing. Um, where are you going to gather the resources you need to create your career? So some of this is your own internal resources. Um, I am very bad at self-care. Every time I get those emails from my university that tell me to take care of myself, I cringe and want to eat potato chips. Uh, but we have to right, do the best with what we've got. So think about when you can't gather the resources for yourself, who can you rely on? For many people, this might be um, family. Right. Um, I'm actually just on the bullet here about gathering resources, but you've got to have enough money, right, to be secure enough to do the work you want to do. Um, so money, right, as we all know, especially those of us who live near and um, work with subsistence communities, it's not all about money. So I write money, but it's really about, right, being able to take care of yourself well enough to do work. If you can't get funding for your work right away because it's novel, find other ways to demonstrate a proof of concept, right? But think about this element of where are you going to get your calories and how are you going to be able to move forward? Time. Right. One of the things I see most with young scholars is that they want to do everything now. So and it, and it tends to be right. The ones who are better and more really engaged, um, they want a theory of everything. I do, too. But we have to think carefully that there are certain things and projects you can do as an undergrad. Right. Or as a graduate student and others are going to wait. So if you can think of your life as a, a long term project and that other money and other opportunities will come as you make them, sort of a, a multiple process of five-year plans, this can ease your mind greatly and help you focus on the work you would like to do. And again, this need not be traditional academic work. Perhaps you want to get uh, a certificate in thinking through how to measure water quality and work uh, for a long time related to community needs, right? These are related. So I write Arctic studies as a very broad tent. Sleep, I just will not say this enough, you have to sleep. Sleep is the only way our brains, right, restore ourselves every day. I will sleep anywhere. I've slept under my desk. I've taken naps with my head down, you know, on Zoom, you know, right? Uh, if you've got to do it, you got to do it. It'll refresh you. So get used to cat naps. And then information. Where are you going to get the information you need? A lot of people um, want information that it's impossible to get. We all do. Um, but at least now, right, thinking about moving away from Generation X, we know in particular that we can create respectful, uh, sol in solidarity, right, relationships with a lot of people who can give us different kinds of information in ways that was not, um, that were not helpful when we were younger. So this is a new frontier. So in your coalition, this just addresses a bit more of the aspect of the academy, Right. So I mentioned family already, but as you move through, if you're doing a more traditional academic set of studies or frankly, if you're not, if you're going to work uh, and you need with communities or in other situations where you don't need a traditional academic degree, this isn't that different. Right. You want to structure people around you who will push you, who will question you 
but ultimately who were on your side. Um, the process of information gathering and usage creates power and these structures of power uh, are everywhere whether or not you are in a community or you're at the academy and you want to make sure that you draw yourself a group around you who push you but are not toxic to you i have watched and you all probably have had these experiences too in particular with women but it's all both genders right people um, think that they have to suffer to get the results that they need and you don't have to and you shouldn't so take a, a bit of positivity take a bit of control and remember that the people you put in your coalition should ultimately be there for you and for the work that you want to do and so the last line here is really you know um, we all become different people over time our lives have chapters whether or not they're getting a phd or doing uh, grant funded work or working with other students many of you will be working closely with other people who want to learn from you and understand and know your expertise so really you know as you move through this career the best way to think through breaking through ceilings is to be confident enough in yourself that you can tell the truth right, about the work you're doing, about the results you have, about where you are in your career, and sometimes about other people. And that can be painful. So one of the best lessons I've learned, um, if you remember nothing else from this PowerPoint, is uh, find and colleagues who are thought of as difficult people and see why that's the case. Um, one of the best things you can do for yourself is to become someone, again, if it's in your nature, who works with and gets the most value from, for the group, from people who can be difficult. Um, often you'll find they're not uh, in that corner, uh, always because they actually are, but because they have ideas and ways of behaving and acting that are of value but not recognized in the current system. So just a, a bit of advice. Plus then everybody likes you because you are operating with that individual. And so that was a, a quick overview. Um, and I'm happy to answer more personal questions. I'm just not, uh, I just don't put them out there right there. And I want to thank everybody. And I, I'm ready for the conversation because that's going to be the exciting part. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much. And if everyone could again join me in giving a huge virtual round of applause to Dr. Lovecraft. Uh, I know that you can't hear the thunderous applause on Zoom, but uh, I am very confident that it is echoing in, in everyone's offices. Um, so we are going to move into our question and answer session now. And again, there will be a recording of this webinar emailed out alongside many hyperlinks to things that both Dr. Middleton and Dr. Lovecraft have mentioned. So if you were like me and scribbling a lot of notes, um, please know that we will help you in finding some of those resources. So I'm going to now find Dr. Middleton in our Zoom room and bring her to our stage because our first question that has come in is for both of our speakers. So this question from Anne is, do you believe that women succeed if they copy a male perspective or by remaining in symbiosis to manage a male-female anima, because that is the concept which we obtain from proper cognitive and emotional upbringing, i.e. from the community. Either of you want to, to take that first? Wow, that's kind of a union. Uh question there we have going on. Um, Alexandra, were you able to hear that? I, I, I saw you didn't have your headphones on yet. Sh should we get it again? So, sorry, yes, I, I, I didn't hear the whole question, yes. Yeah, so I'll read it one more time. Uh, so this is from Anne and she would like to know, do you believe that women succeed if they copy a male perspective or by remaining in symbiosis to manage a male female anima? Because that is the concept which we obtain from proper cognitive emotional upbringing, i.e. from the community. 
So I'll just uh, briefly say, um, anytime a, a clinic question has proper in it, I immediately, uh, you know, react like, what is what is proper? So my, I would just want to say no. And I think that the reason I come out with a strong no on that is that we have to remember that we aren't essentialists right? Um, Women uh, and men uh, have traditionally and by society, these different kinds of energies. I'm going to be Jungian about it too, right? Uh, Often, uh, you know, Asian cultures have a bit lighter or a bit more relaxed definition of that. You know, everyone's seen the yin and the yang. And so I encourage everyone to think much less about your own gender in those energies and think more about what is needed when. Right. And this is tricky because in particular faculty, like if you're a teaching professor, we're asked to be more and more and more as budget shrink. We're our own administrators, we're our own educators, we're our own social workers sometimes. And so this shows us, right, sometimes you've got to have that assertive, almost aggressive passion, right, at, at chasing down money or standing up for something that really matters to you in what you're studying. But other times we really have to be kind and we have to be caring if a student is in front of us right? Crying often. They, they have, you know, who knows what's going on in their life. And it's not our place to tell them, I don't think personally, to suck it up and just deal with the system. We can't live their lives for them, right? But we can be agents of change and of help. So frankly, I really think it's much more that it's important for us to think about what kind of energy is needed. Is it more of what we call masculine in air quotes energy, or is it going to be more of what is labeled as in air quotes feminine? Both genders have full range to to exercise those things. That that was really good answer. And what I maybe have to add here from your lecture, what you said to be true to yourself and do what you feel is most relevant and most meaningful to you. Because uh, like um, judging from my own experience, if I would be just concentrated on career promotion and uh, publishing um, articles, you know, this uh, exact amount of articles per year, and then I won't be engaged in the the work that is most meaningful for me like science diplomacy or engaging with stakeholders and communicating my research and making it uh, like relevant for policy makers and trying to make some change so that's uh, that's actually the essence like be true to yourself what matters most Definitely wise, but hard words to take away and put into action, I think. Um, We have our next question from Lauren, who I am going to ask to come on and ask her question herself. Hi, Dr. Lovecraft. It is so wonderful to see you. (laughs) Um, So my question was, uh, just in both both of your personal experiences working in Northern Academia, what has been the biggest changes that you've experienced for women and where do you want to see more change? I think you've kind of gone over it a wee bit um, with the expectations of professors and it's, you know, being more personable and uh, empathetic to what students are going through, which is a wonderful change, but where else would you see, like to see more changes? I, I don't want to, I'm that person who always talks. And so I'm mindful. I work really hard to let other people speak first, but I'm also mindful of time. So I would just say, I'll just offer one. And then, uh, so I'd say one of the, the biggest changes is just seeing more women, right? We talk a lot about representation and why it matters that we don't just have, you know, one color in a cabinet or, you know, one gender or even one frankly, ideology, right? We, we all know, especially those of you who do more biological systems, right? That diversity creates this richness. It's the same in economic theory, right? We can, the more we can come together and, and divide up some labor and work together, the more stuff we can make. Though we don't really need more stuff. But the point is, right, that I think, Lauren, your your question is a good one because we see each other, we recognize each other, we think about each other. And I think that's one of the most significant changes that, that makes a difference that matters. And also, I think all these uh, recent initiatives that we have seen, like uh, gender, um, 
um, plan A and uh, this uh, series of seminars, you know, having having the opportunity to speak and uh, creating awareness that there, there are still some problems and there are still some biases uh, inside academia that we all need to overcome. Actually, I'll give one more concrete result, uh, thing and that is just babies, right? For men and for women, we, we, some of it's being in Alaska, but I do know that the profession has really changed in terms of people being able to say out loud, I have a baby. You know, I, I have I have to go or, uh, you know, most of us probably are still breastfeeding in bathrooms. I mean, I that's now a little while ago for me, you know, eight years ago, but it's still now. So there, you know, on the one hand, we've made this great progress. On the other hand, sometimes having more women around, we just talk about how things aren't equitable together. So it's it's both right. We, we do have to actually work for some solid changes that are more often related to women in particular. Right. Child care. But, you know, often now you can bring, you know, people can bring babies or, or children uh, with them. We've learned that they're not right antithetical to education necessarily. So I think that's a, a really concrete positive change. I just wanted to come up with an actual example. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Writing down both of these concrete changes to, to celebrate and also push further. Um, we have another question from Sasha, if you would like to come on and ask yours next. Hi, um, thank you for the, the great talks. Um, so one of the things that I've noticed while being in academia and potentially as a consequence of the leaky pipeline that um, was brought up was that um, Many women, especially faculty members or higher up in academia, seem to um, take up um, personas that that stereotypically emulate um, kind of male attributes um, of being overly competitive, for example. Um, and so, I just wanted to ask, um, especially from the, the point of view as um, uh, someone who identifies as a as male in academia. Um, how can we make sure that we're advocating for women um, to be feminine, um, to, to, add, to be activists for uh, feminism and not feel like they're sticking out as a sore thumb for, for having these attributes? Do you wanna start Alexandra? It, you, it, at least in your talk, I, I had a feeling that your blend of family and, and work life uh, and such. Maybe you have first insight into that more than I? <clears throat> to be honest, I, I, I don't have any uh, supervisor like or leader who is a female to relate to, but I would say that um, I, would, I wouldn't change, you know, if I would be promoted to <laughs> be a senior academic or to be a principal investigator, I don't think I would ever change just for the sake of the position, because uh, uh, the true qualities that, and that what you represent with your femininity and some soft uh, qualities are very important. Feeling empathetic and uh, being able to relate to your colleagues and to your subordinates, it's uh, very important skill to have and that, that's how you can build a better team I think you know through openness and through transparency not by because the, the leader is not the one who is above all but is someone you want to relate to and to kind of to share your experiences that's how the whole team will benefit from that type of a personality that's what I could say. And I'll just add, so my experience is a bit of the opposite in, in the sense that um, I am, uh, you know, more so when I was a bit younger, but I am competitive and I would have in my career, a lot of qualities that were one would call masculine, right? They're not, they're just who I am, right? They're just qualities. But um, I often got in trouble for that, not, not for femininity or softness, but you know, what one, don't ever, if you happen to be on this call, tell uh, anybody in particular women, because we hear it a lot to calm down, 
You know, I, I got that a lot, you know, nothing will, will set me off more than when I'm arguing passionately for my department or program and a, and a higher up person tells me to calm down. So I say that, right, just as, as to say that really issues like femininity or softness or, or things that we traditionally associate with women, I have people around me who are men who do that much better, in fact. Than, than I do. So I would really say that it's a matter of really respecting diversity, right? Respecting that the men and women you work with or people who choose to neither identify in, in either case. I, I really struggle with having to label myself. I, I don't think, I don't know, that's a whole different webinar. But I think that the, the more we just accept individuals as individuals and we think about them, are they doing right? what's best in, in my case for the academy? Right? Are, are they behaving in ways that push other students that do create degrees of competition, right? But that create this meritocracy in ways that allow all people to succeed. I think that's much more significant than worrying a bit too much about which gender is, is exercising those kinds of attributes. Thank you. Um, we have time for a few more questions. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. We have two more that have come in, so I'll ask those. Uh, the first is to both of you, but uh, from a slightly different angle, and it has to do with funding. Um, so Dr. Middleton, uh, you showed a chart about how, based on your name, you have different funding success. How can we change that? Because funding is so important to publications, promotion, um, and how we can succeed in academia. And the funding follow-up uh, for Dr. Lovecraft is specifically about transdisciplinarity in funding. And it is very difficult to get projects funded across disciplines. How do you layer these difficulties of gender and transdisciplinarity to get projects funded? Uh, a big funding question. <clears throat> yeah, I can start to, in that article, they already have some suggestions how this can be overcome. So if um, researchers are applying with their names and you could see that uh, the female is underperforming in terms of publications, there could be some adjustment uh, uh, rating. So you, it could be like multiplied to be on the on par with um, uh, male investigator, principal investigator, so females won't be disadvantaged because, for instance, career breaks or whatever circumstances that didn't make, um, didn't produce, that they couldn't produce as many publications as uh, their male peers. Um, so in, in terms of funding, uh, one thing we want to remember is that, you know, money breeds money. So maybe you have real transdisciplinary designs on uh, whatever subject it is that interests you. Um, it's true. On, on the one hand, it is a bit more difficult. I say a bit because the, the tide is turning um, and it depends on the kind of funding you're looking for and how you're going about doing it. Solo or, or very or small projects that are transdisciplinary do have a more difficult time because it is more difficult in small scale projects to often make the best case for transdisciplinarity, whether it's tr true or not. On the other hand, right, the um, possibility for in particular women, I think, as well as other people who um, for whatever reason have been on the marginal edges of funding, there is more opportunity now, I think, than there has been in a long time in large teams. So the concrete suggestion I would make would be try to get funding that's small, a few thousand dollars here and there from doing uh, tasks or contracts or research that maybe isn't uh, your number one interest, but you know will get some funding and you know you can do a good job for. Because as soon as reviewers look and see that other people have trusted you with some funding, maybe you don't have a publication for it. Maybe you created a, a community-based website or you gave really solid feedback to a community or a group of students. Um, these bits of funding will then be signals that you can take on more and more. So some of this is the patience. 
issue too, right? Um, you know, you, you get small amounts of money and then over time as your career grows and you know more people, right? The money gets larger um, and the capacity to do more novel or, or more silo busting kind of work gets stronger too. The academy, right, and all these funding agencies and everything, while there's, they seem big, right, are, aren't that, there's not that many in particular doing Arctic studies. So shepherd your reputation in the sense, right, of knowing the work you like to do, being willing to either call or have someone help you, a lot of us are introverts, and start calling around to program managers, you know, just use the system to ask questions and, and be patient. And uh, the last Thing, I don't know, funding is a big deal and I get it. So the last thing is, right, find people who have money and work with them. I saw uh, Oren Young is on here. Uh, I worked with Dr. Terry Chapin. Um, you know, find people who you can work well with who do big money projects and learn from them and, and ask them questions about how it goes. Great. Those were both two excellent answers. And as someone earlier in their career, uh, a lot of pieces of advice that I will be taking uh, after this webinar. Uh, so we have one more question, and I think this is a, a good one to end on because it's a what comes next question. Um, we just went through a pretty devastating year, uh, personally, professionally across the planet with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and we are still very much in that crisis. And alongside that public health crisis was a woman in the workforce crisis uh, that Dr. Middleton highlighted. And I'm sure we have all either personally experienced or we have seen within our universities, our organizations. Um, so as we are finishing this webinar, uh, my own final question is, what comes next uh, in an ideal world um, as we create ambitions for the climate crisis, for public health? Uh, what, what is the big vision for women in the workforce, whether that is in academia, as researchers, um, wh what is your vision and, uh, you know, how, not how do we get there? Because I think that is uh, far more than what this web webinar can hold. Um, but maybe something for everyone to think about as they continue on with their day after we say goodbye in, in about 10 minutes. I'll get started here then. Um, so uh, where do we go from here? Uh, lift each other up, right? I mean, I think that, you know, while it's there's a lot of cheesy slogans that are going on right now for very, very difficult problems, I think one of the most significant ones is to remember and, uh, and uh, you know, that we, you don't have there, I guess I'm just against binaries. You don't have to push other people down or to get your career farther along. And truly, it won't work, especially doing Arctic work. And, and it doesn't matter if you're a biologist or a social scientist or an anthropologist or, you know, look at politics like myself. But um, it's, a, it's not that big of a, of a place. And um, the phenomenal new relationships we can really now start forging in particular with indigenous communities and individuals um, as part of how we move all the knowledge forward. Um, you know, you can be the bull in the china shop, you know, I, I am, I, I get that phrase all the time, and still bring other people with you. So I think that that's the message I would, would give there is that not only will you feel better as, as you go forward, because other people will be glad, right, for, for well, most people will be glad for the, the, you know, what you can offer. But the other piece is, you know, it will only help you. Right. So by creating, you know, if, if nothing else, just a few other people that you communicate with and collaborate with, um, the struggles of the pandemic are real. Um, I don't have four children. I have one. And that has been more than enough to make me, you know, not be able to work as much as I could. We, we can't. The idea that all of us, you know, in, in the aftermath of this have the same energy reserves or the same capacity to function is just not true. So don't sell yourself right up the river because you are doing less and you can't think well lately. And oh good, 
And I'm gonna go now to Alexandra so she can show us um, the number one value, right, in this whole conversation. And that's that we're gonna make the Arctic safer and healthier and hopefully colder for the next generation. To be honest, I'm not sure I could answer because the baby started <laughs> being a bit uh, loud. <laughs> so I can type my answer in the, in the chat box. So you, hello from Nicole to Andrew. <laughs> yeah, please, please type your answer uh, when you can or type it to me so we can share it in email. Uh, there is no rush to do multitasking uh, right now at the same time. But hey, you know, it just occurs to me too that for those of you who do work in communities across the Arctic, right, you know, one of the most positive experiences my spouse and I had when we were doing some co-research is, uh, and I'll shout out to Cox of you, you know, we had to take our son and he was small and uh, where else except a lot of places in the Arctic um, do you get to bring a child, the child plays in the assembly room floor and you carry on really meaningful research with people. So I think the Arctic more than, and then the Arctic is big, right? But there's a lot of remote and rural research we can do that's actually really family friendly if a person chooses to have a, a family um, because people multitask all the time and, and we can do it too when we need to. There's no shame in, in having the, that's another one of these positive changes, right? Is that maybe people still frown on children. I mean, I frown at children, but nonetheless, right? They're often far more welcome on research trips than they ever would have been before. Yeah, absolutely. And that's actually something that we will be talking about in the fall um, as we look more purposefully at funding and invite some funders who have made decisions to support full families to go on field work um, or childcare for researchers and how that is starting to change um, the visions uh, and the narrative of what is possible. So be on the lookout for that follow-up uh, this fall. But for now, I again want to ask everyone to join me in giving a huge, huge round of applause. Thank you so much, Dr. Lovecraft, Dr. Middleton, um, for just being here, but also sharing so much of your expertise and your experience with everyone being so open in your responses to questions. I know I learned a lot and I am very confident everyone else here has learned a lot too, given the comments we're getting in the chat. As a reminder, um, this is one of many webinars we are running through 2021. We have the recordings of five previous webinars that look at many different issues from diets to murdered and missing indigenous women uh, gaps in data. So please look back at our YouTube page for all of those recordings and join us for our upcoming webinars on everything from diversity and inclusion in federal policy to boreal forests and carbon capture to uh, our next webinar on May 21st, Wounded Healers, Video Expression, Reflection and Transforming Research, where we will hear from two amazing women about strengths-based research and transforming the research process through critical reflection and new expression. And they'll be sharing a video with us. I hope to see all of you there. Thank you again for joining us today. And I hope you all have 